it's a miracle that the Phillips collection, as it exists today, ever happened at all, because uh, Duncan Phillips was as good and gentle and nice and sweet a man as I ever knew, was brought up in the, and uh, entirely brought up, in the, what used to be called the American genteel tradition. And the American genteel tradition was certainly hostile to the kind of works of art that Duncan Phillips acquired. I would be inclined, I should be inclined myself to say it was generally hostile to art and uh, of, of any very vigorous kind. And in some miraculous way, uh, far more of a miracle for him than for his wonderful wife, Marjorie, he escaped from the paralysis of this dreadful American gentility and uh, began to see a wholly new kind of art. Compared to the great museums with their historical sequences, and their comprehensive reviews of different racial cultures, what we offer is the simple pleasure of becoming at close range so familiar with a collection that is ever in the making that we seem to be participating in the exciting thematic contacts of old and new, traditional and experimental. Duncan Phillips had a very good eye and at a time when other people with good eye had little or no money, he had at least enough to buy some very great pictures. And when he liked somebody's work, really committed himself to it and bought it in depth in a way almost no one else did. You know, he didn't do it, goodness knows, to make an impression on anyone. He did it because he loved works of art. It was a revelation as he took me personally around this collection to have him go on in exactly the same tones of enthusiasm about a totally non-objective painting as he had about a representational painting hanging right next to it. The gallery was an important part of the town and, and they were very well known and very well respected. And they were absolutely lovely. They were so sort of refined and delicate looking. I do not venture to anticipate posterity and the ultimate valuations of history. It is impossible to judge contemporary works of art without historical detachment. My choices have been frankly personal. The collector can only be true to himself. In 1895, my grandparents uh, decided that Pittsburgh winters were too much for them. They had heard a rumor that Washington was a delightful southern town with a benevolent climate. And they made the decision to move to Washington and built what was to become not only their home, but later the Phillips Collection. My father grew up here in this house. He had an older brother, uh, two years older, who really was inseparable. They had common tastes. They went to the same schools here in Washington. Uh, when it came time to go to college, the older brother, Jim, held back for a couple of years so they could do it together. By 1914, the two brothers moved to New York and, and lobbied their parents for uh, money so that they could start to build a collection. And apparently they were moderately successful in persuading the rather conservative Phillipses to, uh, to let them do that. At just about the time of World War I, there were some really cataclysmic events in my father's life. He went up to Nantucket to, to um, attend his brother's marriage. And um, while, actually, while he was on the island, he got news that his father had died in 1917, and uh, he, he had great difficulty getting back to Washington, but, but of course did, and um, went into deep mourning over that, and then, then really just, I 
I believe less than a year later, his, his brother died. Oh, I was just under a year. Uh, I was the, the only son of, of Duncan's uh, only brother, who he'd been very close to. He went into a period of great despondency and um, looked for a way. What, what finally brought him out of it was, was the idea that he could create a memorial to them, which would at the same time bring out his own best gifts. And uh, uh, the idea was a memorial in the form of an art museum. My father set about collecting at a rapid rate, essentially in agreement with his mother. In the space of, say, three years, they bought something like 200 paintings. A selection of these paintings was previewed at the Century Club in, in January of 1921, and my mother's painter uncle, really a very good painter, Gifford Beale, invited her to come see it. And uh, as she entered, uh, she was spotted by, by the, my father himself, who, who said, who offered to take her around and explain his collection. <laughs> the centurion was standing near, near me and he just asked some question. I mean, I didn't know him, who he was, but just the way you do. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Duncan came up immediately and answered the question. <laughs> and uh, then, then he uh, said that he had seen me around in the galleries. <laughs> Duncan's approach to art was essentially very poetic. He believed, I think, that the artist needed to experience uh, a, a poetic moment of perception and then find a, a painterly equivalent for it. And in finding the painterly equivalent, he was very much of a modernist. I mean, he believed very much in the, in the painted surface and, and, and what the artist could do with color and texture. And I think Marjorie very much shared that taste, and I think they worked together very harmoniously as a partnership. Plans were being made to open the museum in the fall. It was opened uh, the year we were married, 1921. There were about three rooms in use at the time. That was one of his great longings, to keep it in a home. His happiest times with paintings were in a, in a home where they seemed to belong. One was made quite welcome there. There were big chairs, and and uh, one could sit. And uh, I can't believe this, but one could smoke. There were ashtrays, and, uh, uh, and one could look. And there was plenty to look at. The concept that it embodies that of a house museum was the first instruction I gave to I.M. Pei when time came to build on an East Building to the National Gallery. I think museums are compromises which uh, we make between an, the need of the public to see works of art and the natural habitat of the modern picture, which is in the private home or the artist's studio. Modern art did not have, as the art of the Renaissance did or medieval art, a collective mode of address. It had a kind of private mode of address. Some of the most important acquisitions were made just before the opening and, and then in the first several years afterwards. Important French artists who really were not normally collected by Americans of that period. In 1923, he and my mother went to Paris, and I think partly to show the seriousness of purpose and the importance of it, they, um, they acquired the great boating party painting by Renoir, Luncheon of the Boating Party, which to this day is the centerpiece of our collection. We were invited to lunch, and there was the painting right opposite us which we couldn't have enjoyed more. It was uh, 
strategically done and, and, and appreciated. <laughs> you can see the boats in the background. People that were out voting on the Seine would then come to this restaurant and have lunch. The different personalities and the, the color and that uh, inverted perspective. It's just every inch is alive. And they paid something like $125,000 for it then, the, the, the highest that had ever been paid for an Impressionist painting. He bought pictures by artists who were already fixed in the history of art. Among those painters, he did succeed in getting real masterpieces. Paris, 
to New York, and uh, in the 20s and 30s, Phillips uh, bought a lot of his work. It really became not just a gallery of contemporary art, but modern art in, in a more radical sense. It preceded the Museum of Modern Art in New York by eight years. The Phillips was really, was really kind of an outpost of modern art in a fairly Philistine community. I can remember hearing conversations, overhearing conversations of people both in Washington and in New York and so forth, feeling that, that Duncan had, had, and Marjorie had rather gone off the deep end and, uh, and that they were really buying a lot of work that was uh, of questionable value. By 1930, they had accumulated something like 600 paintings. We only had three galleries at that point to show them. The decision was made to move out of this house completely, convert the whole thing into a museum, and the family would build elsewhere in Washington. One room of the new house was set aside as my mother's studio, and she tried to work there every single day. It was a strange life for a boy to have both his father and mother so intent on painting. Some artists would, would visit. Uh, there was a flow of guests. A great deal of my knowledge of, of what was happening here at the museum in those early years is really based on what my father would come home with. Frankly, I was, like most children, not easily persuaded to, to visit museums. My grandmother was always inspired by Bonar. I think his landscapes were always in the back of her mind when she approached her own and his still lives, his use of color. When Bonar first visited us, we already had five. And then the next year, Matisse came to the gallery. Matisse actually made the remark you're right to have five Bonars. We had just one of his at the time. He said he's the best of us all. Bonar painted with a modesty that was almost obsessive and a sense of keeping the pictures to himself. Um, he wanted them to go on, just like coming to the Phillips Collection and demanding a paintbrush. When Bonar came to visit the museum, he saw a small section of early spring, which he wanted to change. He asked my mother and father for paints. We just loved it as it was. Somehow we both knew that uh, you can't just do an inch of a painting. So I pretended I didn't have my paints in the house. They were out in the country. And so uh, there was no chance. I think that was really an inspired bit of collecting because even the French really didn't appreciate those late, great Bonar pictures. I mean, witnessing almost how the Bonar show came about. A French curator from the Beaubourg was, was in Washington and, and looked at those pictures and said, if France could only see Bonar the way you can see Bonar in America, I mean, you can't see pictures like this in France. Matisse recognized Bonar's greatness, too, and, and made a comment that's very touching. They were at a dinner party together in Paris in the 40s, and Matisse said to Bonar, you and I were the two greatest painters of the 20th century. And, Bonar said to Matisse, well, you might be, but I'm not dead yet. He seemed to be one of the most uh, um, just pure artists that, that I've ever met. In a sense, we're terribly fortunate because unlike some other museums, we have a very special focus. The emergence of modern art at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. But my father made a huge point that he was also collecting the sources of modern art. Our sources are also our modernists. In other words, our heroes of evolutionary progress in art. They include Giorgione, the inventor of romantic landscape as an end in itself, of the easel picture intended for the whole. The continuity of tradition is my most compelling interest in forming and interpreting a collection of modern art and its sources. 
the modern artist must be able to submit his work to the test of being seen in the company of the 19th century titans. Ours is an unorthodox museum with a way of its own in not segregating periods and nationalities, the better to show the universality of art and the continuities of such ancient seeing habits as realism, expressionism, and, and abstraction. He wanted to hang pictures in a way that was provocative, which nevertheless perhaps had nothing to do with, with, with historical periods or styles. And a very good example of this was that he, he would always hang the two portraits of St. Peter, one by El Greco and one by uh, Goya together. I think one of the things one feels as one looks at the Phillips collection and uh, enjoys about it is precisely the disequilibrium in the number of works by this or that artist, which gives to the collection its personal and private character. Each hanging was a thing of constant refinement. He loved to get into one-to-one -one conversations with people, and nothing he liked better than to take them through the museum. We still get letters from people saying that they've never forgotten that 10-minute walkthrough that they had with him, you know, 30 years ago. My father loved to get interesting people in the house and draw them out very carefully in the early years on art subjects, but later in his life he got very interested in politics, especially in international politics. Wartime Washington, I hear, was a very exciting place. The gallery was visited and discovered by so many people who came to Washington because of the war. It was an active period. For example, there were two concerts every week instead of the present one. which he finally reveled in. It's now one of our prized possessions, the Studio K. Saint Michel. There's a figure on a couch and uh, a view across the Seine. Painting has stuck in my head uh, ever since I first laid eyes on it there. I've discovered pieces of that painting coming out in my own uh, over, over the years. Phillips was actually one of the few places that you could find contemporary art, and not only contemporary art, but up-to-date contemporary art that was really much like uh, that of New York. and that I had seen the California figurative paintings of Diebenkorn, and it was here at least that I could find two. But while here is that also is that I became quite enchanted with the uh, Rothko paintings. I think it was in the late 50s, my father had the first museum exhibition of Rothko. It was a major event for Washington, which had never seen anything quite like it. Father immediately bought one from the show within two or three years, bought three more. In 1960, again, the collection had outstripped the space available to show it, so an addition was built. My father set aside a special room to show this new unit of Rothko.
because they were rather nice uh, Eames chairs, I think they were, and they were rather colorful. So it was decided at that time, at his request, that this very simple bench would be brought in from a sculpture court. And from then on, we had just the simple bench in this room. We used to call it a chapel, but it was gay, gay in color. But, but people said it was a wonderful place to go and meditate. Nobody had bought that many Rothkos at that time, nor did they think to hang them as a group, which is, of course, very much the way Rothko wanted them hung. Shortly before my father died in 1966, he left a set of instructions to his successors. It seems that he had this unusual open-mindedness of not wanting the museum to be a closed book. He always wanted new acquisitions to take place. We were always on the lookout for younger artists whose work seems to um, grow out of the favorites that are already here. It's not a giant collection. It's not a giant museum, thank God. But it's it's a it's a marvelously beautiful and and exceptionally valuable uh, result of four two pairs of extraordinarily discerning eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome. It's always a very exciting thing to present young professionals making their Washington debut here in our music room. <laughs> 